Hey everyone, hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Shelly and today I'm going to be sharing with you my top nonfiction books of all time. Now this is quite a timely video because Nonfiction November is coming right up. Nonfiction November is a month long event encouraging everyone to read a little bit more nonfiction than they normally would and it is hosted by Olive at A Book Olive. Now, Kristen at Enter the Book, she did a video of her top favorite nonfiction books of all time. And then of course, the Steve Donahue weaponized this into a tag. And I really love the idea, and so I wanted to do my own version. Now, if you are new to my channel, then hi, welcome. I love books and reading, and I love nonfiction. <laughs> if you also love books and reading, I would encourage you to subscribe and stick around. Oh, and everyone that I mentioned just now, I'm going to leave a link down below. Now, let's just go ahead and just jump into the meat of this video. The first book on my list is actually going to be two books and it's a duology and it is Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Art Spiegelman tells the story of his father who was a Polish Jew living in Poland during the time when World War II broke out. This is done in the style of a, of a graphic novel and at the time um, when I read this, I read this in college and undergraduate school, I didn't realize that a graphic novel could tell a good story like I had my own you know my own biases against graphic novels and I read this and this blew my mind at the time because it was done so well for for one the um the Jews in this book the Jewish people they're depicted as mice and then the Germans are depicted as cats and in the first book especially it feels like a cat and mouse chase and then in the second book we get more of Art Spiegelman himself, his interiority of struggling to finish telling his father's story, partly because of his relationship with his father, and then also um, because like the subject matter is really difficult, and it's about making those choices to tell somebody else's story. Also, Art Spiegelman popularized, it, to my knowledge, popularized the graphic novel format for nonfiction. Before him, I don't think nonfiction was told in this format hardly ever, and with this n graphic novel duology, which actually won the Pulitzer Prize um, for nonfiction. It really took off. It really created a new genre. And I just have always been in awe of this and what it's done for the literary world, but also the storytelling and just how impactful it is. I did a reread of this recently, and I just thought, again, it was so, so brilliant. Sticking with World War II, we have Eli Wiesel's Night, which um, I read this probably <laughs> about a decade ago, and I still think about the way Witzel is able to depict humanity and the importance of keeping your humanity even through difficult times and I feel like that message even though it's told in the setting of his time during the Holocaust as somebody who lived through the concentration camps and came out on the other side I feel like his message of erring on the side of kindness erring on the side of forgiveness and keeping your dignity through difficult and tr atrocious times was just just so resounding and so powerful that it, I mean it was like he it could he could have been talking about the Holocaust or he really it didn't really need that because his message was so strong beautiful prose work and it's I mean gosh I read this a decade ago and I'm still thinking about it today it's a slim little work won't take you anything to read it but just a, just a wonderful work um, to get your hands on my last book uh, set in World War II is actually one I'm going to recommend to people who think they don't like nonfiction because this writer will get you to love it really good writing really impactful storytelling and I would say that either of her books um, could have made this list but I own this one so <laughs> I'm gonna show you this one but either of her books are great and I'll I'll be sure to mention her other book as well. And that is Lauren Hillenbrand's Unbroken, which tells the story of Olympic runner Louis Zamperini, who was a prisoner of war in Japan during World War II. If you're going with prompts as far as like, um, as far as the nonfiction November prompts go, I would say that this perfectly fits with record because he actually breaks some records as, as an Olympian. And it's, it's just a fascinating story about the human and spirit and what one can endure. Absolutely amazing. But I think what stands out the most is not only is it an incredible, incredible story, but Lauren Hillenbrand has like a knack for writing immensely readable books. Her other book, Sea Biscuit, is about a racehorse and the racehorsing industry during its heyday. And my goodness, I don't care about 
horse racing or anything like that, but she made me care. She made me care. Similar to this, it's just a, a heart-wrenching, incredible story, absolutely incredible story with a message of hope at the end. Since we're talking about humanity and the human heart in a lot of these books, I wanted to mention a book that actually Kristen mentioned at Enter the Book, was one of her top reads, and that is Ta-Nehisi Coates's Between the World and Me. I've read a couple of Coates's work and I works, and I think that this is really at the top of his, his writing career. Career. It's so well done. It's again a very slim work and it is it is made up of three literary essays but they're in the format of letters to his son about what it means to be a black man in the U.S. And I just held certain ideas. I, I just I don't want to get into it because I actually don't want to spoil it because as you read and you go through his thought process I just think it works so well because it's not really about the answer because it's you know literary. I mean it is literary but it's it's more about the questions he's asking and diving into those questions and thinking about them from multiple perspectives. And the question he's essentially asking at the heart of this book is what does it mean to be a black man in the US today? And I feel like after I read this, my empathy grew and I I just, it was just so amazing. A lot of those ideas I continue to think about today and it has really shaped my view of the world in, in a small way, but um, but it has shaped it. And I'm just really, really grateful to have read Between the World and Me. Just fantastic. I mean, oh, so good. <laughs> I guess the rest of these books really did shape my view of the world in some way. And I'm going to mention two books by the same author. It's actually the only, well, no, she has three books out there, but these are the two that I read. And it is Cheryl Strayed's Wild, which is her, it's the story of Cheryl Strayed. It's a memoir um, in which she loses her, her mother. Her mother dies of cancer. That's told pretty right away and she decides after dealing with this grief grief of her mother for a few years and really not handling it well and really kind of straying from the values that she knows that she holds in within herself she decides that she's gonna hike the pacific crest trail now not all of it but she's gonna hike a, a good portion of it and she is wildly inexperienced but she decides to do it and along the way she very much finds herself again. She like comes back to herself. I love this because I just love the nature writing in it. I love the themes that she pulls out a lot. It's a lot about self-forgiveness and grief and doing things that you didn't know you could do and like building your self-confidence. I mean, the whole thing is great. So Wild by Cheryl Strait. And then her lesser known work is actually going to be Tiny Beautiful Things. This is when Cheryl Strait was writing for an online journal called The Rumpus and she was writing anonymously as this character named Sugar who gives advice. And unlike the traditional advice columnist who would very much be like, here are the standard etiquette rules of how to deal with X situation. Instead, she takes the person's question that is heartfelt and tumultuous and full of angst often and full of, of like the inner workings of our lives. And she decides to tell a story about herself that both answers the question and gives the reader tools to perhaps perhaps think about their their question in a different way. And it is one that like it, it feels like it is dripping with honesty. She approaches these letters with one of those ears in which she is listening very intently and she is really trying to understand what are you asking and how can I make you feel less alone. Beautiful, beautiful book. I just, I loved it. It's, it's incredible. I don't have my copy anymore. I actually gave it away, but if I ever see it on the secondhand market, I will pick it up again. All right, my next book. I didn't know that I loved bugs until I read this book and <laughs> I just was like, oh, I I was like, I see you to the author, I feel you, and I want more of you in my life. And that is Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Now this seems to be a very polarizing book, and that's okay because I was on the side of I love this, this is amazing, you are amazing. This book is Annie Dillard writing about her time when she spent a portion of time at Tinker Creek, which was kind of to me in in a sense 
in the middle of nowhere. Like not a lot of access to other people and she's really just thinking about nature and her writing. And what I loved about this was that she is just talking about nature and she's like getting down in the, in the nitty gritty of it all and looking at it and then describing her observations to you. And then also like more of the metaphysical and, and you know, obs observations about the world and life in general and understanding it better. That part I, you know, I enjoyed, but the parts that I really clung to were when she was like talking about a beaver. <laughs> when she's talking about a praying mantis, when she is describing her observations. I was just here for it and I loved it and it really kicked off my interest in bugs. This next book was so good, it really made it into my top reads of last year and I am just in awe of this book. It changed my, it changed the way that I think about women in history and biographies and that is Robert K. Massey's Catherine the Great. So this is obviously about the Tsarist, the last um, Tsarist in Russia who, who ruled and it talks about her whole, her whole life. <laughs> now Robert K. Massey, I don't know how he does it, but there are chapters that are left on like cliffhangers. There is like lover's quarrels in here. There is so much entertaining and readableness to this book because, I should say entertainment and readability to this book. This is actually quite the mammoth. Um, it's, it's a large chunky thing and it was so interesting. I had never really read anything about the Russians before and I haven't read a ton since, but like I was just in awe of of the Russian landscape at this time. I really felt like this helped me um, understand War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy much more than I would have if I hadn't had read it. And Catherine the Great had just a fantastic and incredible Incredible life. If you just want to read a, about a strong woman in history and you want it to be entertaining and enjoyable, this is the book for you. I mean, this is just a wildly entertaining book. And I mean, so, 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 so good. I'm down to my last two and I'm like, where do I start? I love both of them. One of which will probably come, probably come to no surprise to regular viewers of this channel, those who hang out with me quite a bit, but it is Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, in which she talks about females and, and writers and what it means to be a woman and, and a writer. Like one of the things that I was just shocked about was she was talking about the restricted area in the library. And this is in the, you know, 19, 1920s, I think this was published. And she was saying that she still needed her husband's permission in order to access the restricted area of the library. And like how wrong that is and how she doesn't understand why she doesn't have the same rights as her, like as, you know, a, a, an academic man in this, doing the same thing that she's doing and that there are like additional restrictions on her just because she is a woman. And this was amazing. This, like I feel, I felt make, made clear a picture that I, I knew in my heart. After reading it, I just, there was just something that I was like, oh, oh. Oh, it helped me understand, I think, feminism and what it means to be a feminist and why feminism is so important. I think that's the best way to explain it. But it really originated with this. I think before I had a really hazy picture of feminism. And then when I read this, I was like, oh, oh. So yeah, A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. My last book, I was just it just shook me. Like I was so shocked when I read it in the best way because it was like the most honest, the most sincere book I have ever read, I think. I did not know what I was getting into when I jumped into this book. And it is Stag's Leap by Sharon Olds. Sharon Olds is a poet. She is an award-winning poet. And this is a collection of poetry in which she really thinks about the divorce she is going through with her husband and who she is during all of this this time. And in a weird way, it felt like she is like confessing, but not in a way that made me go, oh, mm, I really need to, I gotta, who's call, mom? You call, mom, you calling me? I gotta go. Like, because there are times <laughs> where a writer is call, like talking to the reader and it is just, it's a lot. It is a lot. And I'm like, I think you should have worked that out in therapy and then come and talk to me because I am, I'm not your therapist. This is different. This feels like she is talking with clarity. In a lot of ways, she's still piecing together what happened, but it not in a way where she's like, I need to tell you so I can get it off my chest. It is not like that at all. It is like, she is just pouring her heart out with with 
true honesty and true sincerity and hoping that like you get it and that you take something from it. But if not, like she is being true to herself and who she is as a person. I was just shocked. This was so good. I continue, I also read, let me see, I continue to read Satan Says by her, which is about her childhood. This is her first poetry collection. And I am going to read The Father soon because I recently purchased this and I cannot get enough of Sharon Olds. So a slim little poetry collection, really good, really fascinating. And if you think you don't like poetry, try this. It's just phenomenal. All right, so that's it. I shared. Now it's your turn. Tell me favorite nonfiction books of all time. I could have gone on and on. There are so many nonfiction books that I love that are a wide array of genres and topics, but these were the ones that stood out in my mind and in my collection. Um, yeah, let me know if you've read any of these, if you agree with me, if you disagree with me. I am welcome to all kinds of comments. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so, so much for being here, and I will see you all in my next one. Bye, guys.